thanks a lot for joining us today. Thanks a lot for joining us today for this webinar about the sound subsystem of the kernel. Um, my name is Ivan. I work as a software engineer for a company called CodeThink. And uh, like many of you, I am a kernel enthusiast. Uh, I started 10 months ago uh, as a mentee in Linux kernel mentorship program. Mm, now working with the kernel is a part of my job responsibilities, but in my free time, I still try, I'm still trying to contribute as much as possible to the various subsystems of the kernel. And during the past half a year, I've been actively contributing to the sound subsystem of the kernel. I maintain one of the drivers there and one of the self-tests for the ALSA subsystem as well. Why does this talk actually exist? Um, first of all, uh, honestly, the documentation for the sound subsystem is far from being perfect. Uh, some parts of it are not documented at all. Uh, and uh, the uh, in this talk, is aimed at revealing some of the its dark corners, explaining the obligatory and necessary uh, terms which uh, which are required to understand the sound code in the kernel. Um, the another reason for this talk is that uh, uh, this for some reason this area is not really popular among contributors. So I really would like to bring more talents into it to inspire you to start contributing to the sound subsystem, developing your own drivers, uh, improving things in the sound subsystem of the kernel. Our approximate plan for today's talk is to take a look at the basic structure of the Alpha subsystem, um, talk a little bit about the core abstractions inside Alpha for uh, uh, core structures. Uh, talk about different components we can register on our sound card, how we can control them, how we can play with them, how to initialize them, and so on. Um, we'll discuss a little bit the errors which you can face uh, while developing the sound applications and sound drivers, and uh, debugging approaches which you could use to uh, address such issues. The ALSA, the Advanced Linux sound architecture consists of the user space part, the ALSA user space library, and the kernel space part, which includes the ALSA middle layer and device drivers for the actual sound hardware. Uh, the user space library communicates with the ALSA middle layer, which resides in the kernel space with uh, IOCTL system call, and the ALSA middle layer communicates with device drivers using callbacks. This talk will cover a little bit of the middle layer of the ALSA and uh, the part of device drivers as well. Uh, now we will take a look at the core structure of the sound subsystem, or the structure which is called SND card. This structure represents the abstraction for the sound card hardware. Um, usually, the drivers for sound cards are based on one of the underlying interfaces. For instance, if you have a PCI sound card, uh, it is based on the PCI bus. Uh, the device resides on the PCI bus, and uh, we will register our structure. We will create all the components in the probe method of the underlying PCI device. Uh, also, we can register our own components of the sound card, because obviously the sound card hardware contain various components. For instance, controls, because user obviously would like to control some hardware parameters of the sound card. PCM devices, we will talk about them later. Timers, MIDI bus, and so on. We can, uh, additionally, we can define our own components because obviously not all of the hardware components of the sound cards could actually be standardized. How the sound cards are being initialized in the source. As I already said, in the probe method of the underlying interface, for instance, in the probe method of the PCI device, you can find the following code, which calls the SND card new function or SND dev M card new function, if you prefer manage resource allocation, which is pretty convenient uh, because it will free the card for you uh, at the end uh, of in the exit function of your model. Um, we 
uh, run the SMD card new pass the parent device, for instance, the PCI device to it, pass various components. After that, different uh, pass various arguments. After that, we set the name for our driver, uh, the name for the short name for our sound card, the long name for our sound card, which usually which usually includes the even the IRQ number, uh, which it resides on. After we set all 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 of the names for the card we initialize all the components of the card and only after that we call snd card register which creates the procfs entry in slash proc slash a sound for our sound card how to use sound cards in your system uh, there are a few ways how to view available sound cards in your system and the most convenient one is to just cat the procfs entry Broca sound cards. Let's take a look at it. So if we get this uh, ProcFS entry, uh, we will see the sound cards attached to our system uh, in the format. Here we have the uh, ID of the sound card, the numerical ID. After that, we have the string ID of the sound card, the name of the driver, which we set, the short name of the card, and the long name of, of the card, as you can see, uh, here it is set in the similar for, format to what I described. It has the RQ number as well. Let's talk a little bit about various sound card components which we can register on this core sound card structure. And we will start with the pulse code modulation device. Pulse code modulation device is one of the most important components of the sound card. Uh, and it is represented on the actual hardware via a few hardware components, uh, which are responsible for translating the analog signal into the digital signal and vice versa. So to store sound on our computer, to store sound, for instance, on our drive or in memory, we should uh, translate the analog signal, uh, the sound waveform into the digital form. And this is the responsibility of the PCM device. But how we can actually translate the analog waveform into the digital format? For this purpose, we have a process which is called sampling. Uh, the idea of sampling is pretty simple. We just measure the sound with some frequency and uh, uh, simply uh, save the measurements. Every time, we, uh, so we actually uh, save the points on the waveform with some frequency, uh, with some intervals. Um, one single measurement of the sound at the moment of time is called sample. Here you can see them on the picture. Uh, on the left, we have the uh, analog sound sound waveform. And on the right, we, we have the corresponding uh, digital representation uh, which we received after sampling the analog waveform. Um, the frequency we are making measurements of sound with is called rate, and it is measured in hertz. Uh, for instance, if we have rate equal to 8,000 hertz or 8 kilohertz, that means that we measure the sound 8,000 times per second, which is pretty common for your phones. So when you're talking with your friend, using your phone, uh, the phone uh, records your voice uh, with rate equal to 8,000 hertz. Uh, here you can notice that uh, the uh, resolution of sound waveform representation, which, which we get after the sampling, depends on the rate. And the higher rate we have, the higher resolution of the representation we, we get. Um, obviously, if you have, uh, for instance, stereo device, for instance, these headphones, uh, you would like to keep track of two uh, sound samples at one moment of time for the left ear and for the right ear. And for such purpose, us introduces the concept which is called frame. Uh, frame is a simply group of samples for each channel at one moment of time. So, for instance, if we have stereo, the frame includes samples for two channels. Uh, 
Is it clear enough? Please uh, send plus to the chat uh, if you understood what I was talking about. So I can see the reaction. One second. Um, come on, where is my chat? Chat. Plus, plus. Plus, more pluses. Great. We can go ahead. Um, but where does the sound hardware store frames? And to uh, usually the sound hardware stores frames in the hardware buffer. Usually the hardware buffer is allocated using the DMA. Uh, so the hardware could access it directly and write samples directly into the memory. Um, during this talk, we will talk about uh, two different kinds of buffers, the hardware buffer and the software buffer. Uh, the hardware buffer, as I already described, contains the frames processed by hardware. And the software buffer is allocated in the user space memory by the application, which would like to read some frames or write some frames to the hardware. So uh, the main goal uh, and main responsibility of the ALSA media layer here is to translate recorded samples from our hardware buffer into the software one. Um, obviously, if the ALSA media layer had to copy the data from one buffer to another, the all buffer at one time, it would be insanely slow because copying a, a large, huge buffer is a pretty complicated task. A task it takes a lot of it takes a lot of time. Uh, to reduce the time uh, required to copy data from hardware buffer to the software buffer, the Alfred introduces the concept of periods. Uh, so the buffer is split in to uh, uh, a group of periods. So uh, the period is a small part of the buffer. Uh, each period contains multiple frames. Each time the hardware prepares a new period of data, it calls the ALSA middle layer to uh, process this new uh, chunk of data, the new period. Another uh, Important uh, another important thing about the uh, samples. Another, another important parameter of the samples is the samples format, because obviously the quality of the sound uh, which we store in the digital format depends not only on the rate, but on the form how we store the samples as well. Um, for instance, if we have four bit format, as on the picture on the right, on the slide. Uh, we would have only 16 different uh, variations how we can uh, set the value of sound at one particular moment of time, uh, which would not be pretty precise. Uh, usually we use uh, larger formats, for instance, 8-bit wide or 16-bit wide or 32-bit wide. Uh, to refer to one particular format in the kernel, we have a type which is called SNDPCM format type. Uh, and usually we refer to one particular type uh, using one of the predefined constants. They are predefined in the ALSA uh, layer in the kernel. Um, for instance, SNDPCM format S16LE means that we uh, each our sample contains consists of 16 bits. Uh, it's a signed integer, and the engine of this signed integer is little engine. So the format also matters. Um, the order of uh, hardware stores the samples in the hardware buffer uh, in, par in a particular order. And uh, we can distinguish two main uh, orders of samples in the buffer. And uh, this is the interleaved access mode and non-interleaved access mode. Um, if the, if the hardware puts the samples into the hardware buffer uh, in interleaved mode, it puts the sample for channel one and after that puts the sample for channel two. After this, again, sample for channel one and sample for channel two if we have stereo. So the samples are interleaving. If the hardware puts samples in non-interleaved access mode, uh, the hardware dedicates the part of the buffer for storing the samples for channel one and another par part of the buffer for storage sample for store sample for channel two. So uh, the whole buffer is split into the groups uh, which are 
which are lying con continuously in the memory. So one part for, ch ch for channel one, one for channel two, one for channel three, and so on. Also, we can define our own complex access mode, uh, but in such, because hardware could work in some uh, completely different way uh, from uh, the ways I described. It could put the samples into the buffer in some uh, different order, or it could, uh, could, could, uh, couldn't have the uh, hardware buffer at all, for instance. So uh, the hardware defines some another method of communicating with it. And in such case, we can declare our access mode as complex. Uh, and usually in the kernel, you will, you will see different variations of the interleaving and non-interleaved access modes and a mapped and not a map access mode, because we can divide the access mode into the access modes into the mapped and not mapped ones. The mapped access mode means that we can actually take the part of the hardware buffer and map it into the user space. So the uh, user space application through the ALSA user space library could write to the buffer directly. Uh, the non mapped access mode means that we cannot do this uh, for some particular reason. In such case, uh, we would also need to define our own functions to copy data to the hardware because it would work in some other uh, non, non predefined, non generic way. And as I already mentioned, you will face different variations of interleaved, non interleaved, and mapped, not mapped in the kernel. Um, another important con concept which we need to discuss is uh, PCM substreams. Some, some hardware has a functionality of mixing multiple sound streams together. For instance, in the older hardware, when we didn't have uh, such uh, sound servers as Pulse Audio, which could, move, which could mix multiple streams together and send it into the one stream of audio to the hardware. The hardware uh, had multiple substreams which are mixed together on hardware. And to uh, provide an abstraction for such hardware, uh, the ALSA middle layer, or the, the, the ALSA introduces the concept of substreams. So every substream has a direction because it could be used for playback or for capture, but not for both of them. And uh, the single PCM device can have uh, multiple substreams. So we can stream sound to them simultaneously. Every time you open uh, the PCM device for playback or for capture, the PCM middle layer checks if we still have the free substreams on this PCM device with the desired uh, direction, for instance, with the playback direction. And uh, after that, if we don't have such substream, the asymmetry letter simply returns an error. And if we have the one, um, the uh, sound, the, the asymmetry layer uh, allows us to do some operations with this PCM device. We will talk about it. Uh, in one second after we take a look at how you can view the PCM devices in your system. Ivan, um, yeah. uh, there are a couple of questions in the chat. I think it yep. might help uh, um, them, if answered, sure. help them follow the sure, rest of sure. the presentation better. So would you like me to read them out or can you, yeah, you can see them. Okay. Um, which buffer period decides uh, what will be the latency? Um, what do you mean by latency? I mean, um, yeah, what do you mean by latency? Oh, you, you mean like the the overall latency of the sound uh, system. Um, uh, we can think logically about this. And uh, if we have a larger periods of frames, uh, the copy operation will take longer, but uh, if we have the small buffer uh, and small amount of periods, the copying operation will be faster, but we can face some errors, which I will describe a little bit later, because we can the hardware could accidentally overwrite the buffer before we read the before we read uh, the data which we haven't read yet. Um, the period size 
or the buffer size. Um, what describes the latency of the sound system, uh, the buffer size of the period size, the both of them. Did I answer the question? Uh, because I. Both you're saying, Ivan, that both co both contribute to the latency effect. Yes, for sure, for sure. Maybe there is and, no uh, single uh, period, single field or um, format that affects it. Both of them do. Yes, yeah, yes, that yes. Makes sense. Uh, actually, a lot of parameters affect uh, the latency, uh, but usually the thing which uh, affects latency most is the communication with the hardware not like the the, the is usually it's not the issue of the buffer or period sizes so the other question is could you explain the sense of a substream when recording mm, uh I, for instance i some time ago i was developing the driver for the sound card uh, which has multiple substreams because it literally has multiple inputs which it could mix together so when we record the sound uh you oh, oh, let me think um yeah so when we uh record the sound from it it provides the sound uh to multiple substreams so it actually has a few inputs it it uh, uh produces the uh, when, when we capture some audio data from it, uh, we capture the sound for, oh, sorry, I am a little bit confused. I, again, um, the practical purpose of uh, uh, multiple substreams when we are recording the sound like uh, uh, is not so simple as then we are talking about the playback because uh, obviously when we do playback, uh, uh, the purpose of substreams uh, is uh, more clear because we can mix uh, the sound from multiple sources, for instance, from different, uh, from multiple applications together. Um, but uh, still, some hardware has multiple uh, substreams for capture. Um, for instance, it could uh, record the sound from multiple streams simultaneously. And for such purpose, we could have multiple substreams. That's all that we have. Hope that answers your question. Um, just put follow follow up questions in the chat and then uh, uh, let gi we'll give uh, Ivan to continue the presentation and there is a Q and A time that's coming up. Yeah. Thank you. I hope I answered the question. Um, so to sum up uh, again, uh, Multiple, we could have multiple substreams when we're recording sound. Uh, when the sound card uh, records the sound simultaneously from a few different sources, for instance, for the sound hardware which I had uh, uh, had multiple uh, multiple MIDI ports, so uh, it produced the sound from multiple sources. Uh, usually, nowadays, you will face the PCM devices with only one substream for capture and only one substream for playback because sound mixing is usually done by the sound service as, as Pulse Audio. Um, the PCM device could be initialized uh, via SNT PCM new function. We pass the pointer to the sound card, which we uh, all have already created. Uh, we pass the count of substreams for playback, the count of substreams for capture, and uh, the pointer for the structure to be allocated, uh, the SND PCM structure. To view PCMs in your system, you can use uh, uh, a few different options for that. Uh, for instance, you can use uh, the same ProcFS interface, uh, but instead of the cards, we have the PCM entry in it. Uh, each Row describes the PCM device. Uh, we have the sound card number here. Uh, uh, we have the device, the the number of the PCI, the number of the PCM device on the sound card. We have the ID of this PCM device, the uh, name of this PCM device, and the amount of channels for playback and the amount of channels for capture. Uh, another option which you can use is to use one of the 
uh, really powerful also tools, uh, the A Play or A Record. The A Play will show you the PCM devices uh, which are available to play some sound, and A Record uh, will show you the PCM devices which are available to capture. Um, as you can see, some of my uh, PCM devices are not available for capture, and uh, every row here contains the number of the card, the uh, inf all information about the PCM device itself, uh, the amount of substreams. They are sometimes they are called sub devices, and uh, yeah, uh, that's the most common uh, two ways to view PCM devices in your system. Um, Another important concept is uh, a structure called PCM runtime. Uh, the, every time when we open the PCM device for playback or for capture, we need to keep track of the hardware pointer, of the software pointer, and another variables of our particular capturing or playback process. Uh, and to keep track of them, uh, also introduces the structure called SND PCM runtime. Uh, which is allocated to a particular substream each time we open it for playback or capture. Um, runtime uh, structure stores a lot of different information, including the buffer pointers, the configuration, uh, the spin locks used by also the layer internally, and uh, so on. Now, let's take a look uh, at the whole picture, uh, at the path, the sound goes from the hardware to the user space buffer or in the opposite direction when we are playing sound. Um, let's imagine that a user space application would like to play some samples, uh, play some sound on the hardware. And through IOCTL, uh, the user space process uh, falls into the kernel space function called uh, SNDPCM libxfer. Uh, which does pretty simple thing. Uh, it takes a look at the uh, if we have any uh, fra any uh, frames prepared by hardware, recorded by hardware, and uh, which we can find in the hardware buffer. If we don't have such uh, frames, it's simply uh, the process, the user space process, simply sleeps until we have uh, such frames. And uh, when we have such frames. The SNDPCM libxfer function copies the frames from the hardware buffer into the user space buffer. The hardware, on the other way, every time then the hardware prepares, uh, on the other hand, the, every time the then hardware prepares and another chunk of data and another period, it fires the interrupt and the interrupt handler in the our driver calls the ALSA middle layer function, which tells to the ALSA layer, hey, I have a new chunk of data prepared. You can use it. Here, I also should mention that the DMA buffer, the hardware buffer, uh, is assumed to be circular. That means that then the hardware achieves the end of the buffer. It starts overwriting it from the beginning. Here, I have a more detailed description of the reading process. Uh, I will not stop here because uh, we don't have enough time for it. But if you are curious, you can take a look at the presentation after the talk and uh, uh, take a look at the actual functions, look into the code, mm -hmm. and figure out how it works in details. How the ALSA keeps track on the hardware position in the buffer, so the position the hardware writes to or reads from, and the position uh, in the software buffer where we should take our frames for playback or put our frames during the capture. Uh, for this purpose, ALS middle layer introduces two variables called hardware pointer and application pointer. But don't be confused, they are not pointers. Uh, they mean the count of frames processed by the hardware and the count of frames processed by the application. So every time then the hardware processes, processes a new chunk of data, it updates the hardware pointer, tells the ALSA middle layer that the hardware pointer is updated. And uh, the, the ALSA middle layer increases the hardware pointer correspondingly. And the same with the user space application. Every time we, when we, for instance, read a new uh, more frames, the application pointer is being updated. 
The difference between these two values is called available frames. During the capture, it means the count of frames which we can copy from the hardware device right now, which are prepared, but uh, which have not been read yet. And during the playback process, the available frames means the amount of frames uh, which we can write to the hardware device, which are prepared uh, by the application. Here we should dis discuss uh, the most common error or uh, the group of errors which you will face during developing the sound drivers and sound card uh, and other applications as well. This group of errors is called X-Run. The X-Run group of errors contains two different kinds of errors. The first, this, the first is overrun and the second is underrun. The overrun can happen uh, could happen only during the capture process, and it happens then the application doesn't read from the hardware buffer frequently enough, and the hardware buffer gets overwritten. The hardware buffer is circular. Uh, that means if we don't uh, read from this buffer frequently enough, the hardware pointer could ach achieve the end of this buffer, start rewriting it from the beginning and rewrite the part of the information which we haven't read yet. And in such case, we will have a data loss. This data loss is called overrun. The underrun, on the other hand, could happen only during the playback process. Uh, and it happens then the PCM starts starving for new data. Then application doesn't uh, write data frequently enough. And uh, how we can actually keep track of such errors in the ALS middle layer? For such purpose, we can use uh, the two variables which we have already discussed. That's the hardware point and application pointer variables. Um, if the difference, for instance, during the capture process, if the available frames, the difference between the hardware pointer and application pointer uh, is larger than the buffer size, that means that uh, the hardware pointer made the whole circle and overwritten the part of data. That means overrun. During the playback process, if the difference between the hardware pointer and application pointer is lower when the some some stop threshold, that means that we will start starving for new data soon, and that will mean underrun. That's not the only way how uh, us middle layer detects such issues, but it's one of the ways how we can keep track of them. Uh, I don't have a break for Q&A here, but probably we should make the one uh, because things will get complicated soon. Any questions? No. No questions at all? Is it clear what I just explained? Please send pluses to the chat if it was clear and you understand what's going on. There is one question looks like now. Does ALSA support only PCM streams? Um, PCM device is uh, just uh, an abstraction for uh, the hardware on the board which translates analog signal into the digital signal so that's the main abstraction we uh, record the sound from so uh, uh, actually uh, i'm not sure here but i believe that's the only kind of stream uh, available for for recording and playback some sound in the oscillator at all so um, Yeah, uh, also for sure support, supports MIDI. Uh, I don't know about others. Um, yeah, uh, also for sure support, supports MIDI. I've never heard about TDM, by the way. Um. Yeah, sorry, sorry. I worked with uh, the the scope of this talk is mostly about the PCM devices and uh, the, their abstraction in the kernel and the ALS subsystem is obviously pretty huge. So there are other things there, which is not in scope of this talk.
yeah uh, sorry if i couldn't answer your question uh yeah uh <laughs> hopefully you will still get something useful from this talk uh so let's be uh, i uh i left the most uh uh exciting information to the end <laughs> uh so uh yeah please uh yeah let, let, let's go ahead um how the awesome in the layer communicates with the PCM device. Uh, it was mentioned on the one of the previous slides, so let's check your attention. Could you write to the chat your suggestions? Any suggestions? Come on, no suggestions at all? Uh, okay, as a middle layer uses the callbacks to communicate with the PCM devices. Uh, to define callbacks for a PCM device, we have this uh, scary structure called uh, SND PCM ops. Uh, we can set the callbacks for our PCM device with the SND PCM set ops function. Uh, obviously, we will, don't have to define all of them. There are some generic implementations of some callbacks, uh, which uh, could fit uh, the majority of hardware. Uh, uh, but some of them should be defined anyway. Um, so let me explain the mechanics of, of the callbacks a little bit. Then the LC user space leap, for instance, opens the substream for capturing or playback. It runs the IOCTL to the LC middle layer. Um, and the ALSA middle layer um, calls the open callback, which we defined for our PCM device, which was opened. Uh, similarly with the hardware params callback, when the ALSA user space leap uh, library calls, uh, sets some hardware parameters, uh, the ALSA middle layer passes the hardware parameters to our driver, so we could set it to the hardware via callback. Uh, uh let's take a look at the callbacks in more details uh the first callback is uh, an open callback and uh, the open callback is obviously being called when uh, the substream is open for playback or capture so we receive the substream uh, the pointer to the substream here uh, which was opened um and in the open callback we usually set the hardware description a hardware description is a structure which contains accepted rates counts of channels, period counts and sizes, buffer si possible buffer sizes for our hardware. And uh, it is set yet, so it, it, it is set here. Uh, so yeah, uh, also we can allocate our private structures here. For instance, if we want to keep track of the uh, current opened substream internally in our driver, we will allocate some uh, private structure here. Also, we can set the, the hardware constraints in the open callback. The constraints is other um, important feature of the ALSA. I will not talk about it here, but it's pretty well documented. And it basically allows you to say, if you set this frame rate, my hardware could record this amount of channels, for instance. If you set another frame rate, my hardware will be able to record another count of channels and so on. So it allows you to uh, set your custom restrictions for the hardware, your custom constraints. The call, close callback, on the other hand, is called then the substream is closed. And in the close callback, we usually free our private data, private data which was allocated in the open callback. It has the following prototype, uh, and both the open and close callbacks are not non-atomic, so we can we could sleep in them safely. Uh, another important callbacks are hardware params and hardware free. The hardware params is called then the application sets the hardware settings, for instance, buffer size, period size, the desired format and the desired rate and so on. Um, this callback is non-atomic non and it could be called multiple times because the, the software could set hardware parameters multiple times. And uh, usually in these callbacks, we do some hardware setup and uh, some, sometimes we do unmanaged buffer allocation here if we decided to use unmanaged buffer allocation. Uh, there are generally two 
different kinds of uh, memory allocation in the LSS subsystem, the unmanaged and managed. Um, the, the unmanaged memory allocation means that uh, we reallocate the pages for our hardware in the initialization of our sound card method. And uh, after that, every time uh, the hardware params is called uh, for, for one capturing or playback process for uh, every process with the PCM we have, we allocate some pages for our hardware, for instance, uh, using the DMA. So we can allocate the, we, we can define the custom behavior of buffer allocation. Uh, if we choose managed buffer allocation, we can call the SND PCM set managed buffer all function once, and it will allocate uh, the pages for us, which is pretty convenient. And when you're dealing with the majority of sound hardware, uh, it could be enough for you. So two kinds of allocation. In hardware free, uh, which is called just before close, uh, we usually free the resources which was allocated for the hardware. Uh, this callback is also could be called multiple times. The prepare callback is called every time the SND PCM prepare function is called in the kernel or in the ALSA uh, user space library. And usually the SND pre PCM prepare function is called when we face X runs. So this method is aimed at uh, recovering from X runs. Uh, here we also can set some hardware params as rate, format, and uh, it's, this callback is non-atomic. We can sleep in it. And it also could be called multiple times. The difference between this callback and the hard, hardware, uh, hardware params callback is that prepare is called anytime uh, we have an X run and we call the SND PCM prepare. That's the main difference between them. Um, the trigger callback is called every time the, some event is happening with our PCM device. For instance, then the PCM device is started, stopped, uh, paused, suspended, resumed, and so on. Uh, this callback is atomic and, uh, yeah, it's also pretty useful. The pointer callback is one of the most important callbacks, uh, and it is called then the ALSA middle layer wants to know the hardware pointer from our hardware, which points to the hardware buffer. So this callback returns uh, the hardware pointer in frames. Uh, don't confuse this hardware pointer with the, the HV pointer variable, which we discussed. Uh, this hardware pointer is related to the actual hardware. Usually we read the hardware register here and uh, return the pointer value in frames. Um, we, the IOCTAL callback is not so important. Uh, usually it is predefined. I, I just decided to describe it because the behavior of it is not really obvious. Uh, this callback allows us to redefine some of the PCM uh, IOCTALs. You could not define the new IOCTAL using this callback. Uh, actually, you can redefine on the free, only three of them, uh, which are presented on this slide. And uh, usually the ALS middle layer provides the generic implementation for all the IOCTALs. So you do not have to implement it yourself, but uh, it still could be useful sometimes. That's all about the callbacks. Uh, obviously there are many other callbacks there, um, but oh, they are also pretty good documented and they, they have good documentation. Uh, you will find all the links in the useful resources at the end. And uh, you can, uh, if you're curious, take a look at them. How the PCM device could be tested. Uh, for testing the PCM device, uh, you can use uh, one of the very powerful tools, uh, which we already used a little bit for li listing the PCM devices in your system. These tools are called iRecord and iPlay. Uh, there are extremely powerful tools. You can literally set all the hardware parameters with them. You can record uh, the sound in interleaved or non-interleaved access mode, as I described. You can uh, select different formats, different frame rates, different amount of channels, 
and uh, and so on. Um, um, so, for instance, um, I will I have a virtual machine here, and uh, let me run it. Uh, on this virtual machine, I have three sound cards, and the two of them are related to the loopback model, uh, which is pretty useful, and it represents the software loopback. Basically, all the sound you send to the uh, one PCM device appears on the other end in the other uh, on the on the other card abstraction. So you can uh, send the uh, sound here, and and you will uh, get the output from the substream on the other device. It's pretty cool. Uh, let me. Uh, record some sound from it. So we uh, type a record, we specify the device. Uh, you can use it like that, the number of the card, the number of the device, for instance, that one. Um, after that, we need to specify the count of channels, for instance, four. Uh, we specify the rate, uh, 48 kilohertz. We specify the format. For instance, sign 16-bit integer in the little Indian. We specify the duration, for instance, five seconds, and we specify the file name. Oh, all right. Uh, what's going on? Oh, all right. Oh, oh my indentation is broken. Sorry. Uh, again, a record um, minus D def. Uh, one sec. I have a I have a script for that. Um, like that. So. Basically, you type a record minus D hardware. You specify the card you want to record the some sound from. You specify the device. You specify the amount of channels, as I already said. You specify the format and the frame rate and the duration. Five and the output file. After that, uh, it records some sound. Uh, Take a look, yeah, five seconds. Also, it has uh, pretty convenient features. For instance, you can uh, specify dash I parameter and hit pause. So that means interactive. Uh, you press space and you hit pause here and you can release. Really powerful tools. Any questions at this point? There is one in the uh, uh, chat, Ivan. Uh, yes. Uh, the first two I'll look back. The third one is my PCM test driver. That's true. Oop. Something is come on. Um, yeah, the second one is my PCM test driver. I will use it for the further demo. <laughs> uh, all right. Uh, any other questions? Nope. All right, let's go ahead. Um, now we'll discuss another component which you can define or your, on your sound card. Uh, it's a component called controls. Obviously, the user uh, might like to control some uh, hardware parameters, some parameters on your hardware device. And for such purpose, he can use controls. Uh, the, the, there are three main types of controls which we can define. It could be uh, the integer controls, for instance, the, the amount of distortion, the, the volume, which could be set as an integer value with the minimum possible value, the maximum possible value, and the step, which it could be increased with. Uh, you can define a switch, uh, the Boolean type of control, for instance, enable or disable the hardware loopback. Or you can uh, define the enumeration type of control, which basically allows to the, the user to choose from uh, a few predefined options. Um, here I should mention that all of the controls should follow the naming convention. It's not obligatory, but you should. Uh, the format is described here, but also in the documentation. And uh, yeah, uh, how how the controls are defined. 
to define the control, we create the SNDK control new struct. Uh, we pass the interface this control is related to. For instance, in this example, we say that this uh, control is related to the sound mixer. Um, we have a name for the control here. We have an index for the control because uh, there could be multiple controls with the same name. Um, there could be, uh, oh, yeah, we set the access uh, rules for this control. For instance, in this example, we can read and write from this control. Um, also, the controls could be volatile. That means that the hardware could change it uh, without any notification. And in such case, uh, we had to we have to pull the actually pull the uh, new value every time we would like to read the value from the control. So uh, it couldn't couldn't be cached. Uh, also, we define a free callbacks for our control here. Uh, after that, we call a few functions and add our control to the card with SND control add function. Um, let's take a look at the callbacks because that's pretty important thing about controls. Did you notice that we don't define the type of control here? That's because we will define it in the info callback. Uh, the info callback is called every time the user application uh, uh, likes to know the information about our control. For instance, if we have enumerated type of control, the user space application might like to get information about one particular option. For instance, the option number two. And in such case, uh, we should uh, return the option number two to the it put it into the uh, SND value structure. Uh, in this particular example, we put it into the uh, name field of uh, value dot enumerated uh, structure. Uh, we will take a look about uh, on on the structure uh, on the one of the next slides. Uh, as you can see, I highlighted that we perform some validation here as well. Uh, so uh, yeah, so to, to avoid possible uh, out of bounds accesses and uh, such things. Uh, on the other example, you can see the control with the Boolean type, which is actually the control uh, with the integer type, but <laughs> uh, with only two possible options to choose. The minimum value is set to zero, the maximum is set to one. So we can actually set zero or one. That's a Boolean type of control. The another important callback is a get callback. Uh, it is being called then the user space uh, application would like to get the value of uh, of the control right now. Uh, so in this callback, we usually literally read the value from uh, from the chip, from the hardware device, and put it into the uh, LM value structure, which you can see on the right. The structure looks scary. It contains uh, a union for different types of um, controls, but yeah, that's what we're working with, what we are working with. Uh, here I provide two examples uh, for the integer type of control and for enumerated type of control, uh, which looks pretty similar because uh, they, they, yeah, because they are pretty similar. <laughs> The put callback is called every time the user space application would like to put a new value into the control. And we should validate it before sending it to our hardware because, uh, because we would like to avoid all possible issues here. Um, to view and manipulate controls, you can use one of the utilities. The first one is called a mixer, uh, which has a console interface. The another one uh, uh, has a pseudo graphical interface, and it's called a mixer. Uh, I guess I will skip this demo because we re literally uh, are running out of time right now. Um, so let's discuss the another component, uh, which yeah. I left to the- Sorry. Ivan, sorry, yeah. there's yeah. one uh, question about um, callbacks. 
um, in the chat if you would like to answer that yeah. before you switch yeah, topics. Sure. Um, how callbacks gets registered to sound uh, framework also and when? Uh, the callbacks uh, for the input element uh, are registered and uh, basically we keep the pointers to the callbacks in the SNDK control new structure. After that, in the uh, before before we register our sound card before it appears uh, to user be, before it could be uh, used by some user space application uh, in the uh, initialization method of the card in the probe, uh, which, which is called from the probe method of the underlying interface, we should register all of the elements of the card and uh, add all of the controls, all of the timers, all of the PCM devices before we register our card in the system. So uh, callbacks are uh, registered in the SNTP control new structure and the, com the corresponding control is registered in the init function of the sound card. Uh, how does your user space know that now you have callbacks present and ready to support requests? Uh, you're ready to support the request, then the sound card is registered in the system. Um, did I answer this question? Oh, right. I think they'll Can come I... back if they have a question. Oh, yep. yes, Great. thanks. Okay. Great. <laughs> All right. Uh, yeah, and anyway, uh, the best thing you can do after the webinar is to go and check it yourself because uh, uh, I, I, I'm a little bit nervous and I could be mistaken, <laughs> so please uh, take a look uh, at it yourself because uh, if you're curious, of course, uh, uh, yeah, it's, ob it's obviously better to check yourself uh, as well. I'm just showing you the direction you can look into. But usually, yeah. Uh, you define all the all of the controls in the init function of the uh, of the card. Um, all right, we discussed put put callbacks. Uh, Ivan, uh, oh yeah, move, yeah, move yeah, yeah. Sorry? Just, thank you. What's going on? The chat is uh, visible, so if you can minimize the oh, chat window, oh sorry, get sorry for that. Oh, that's I okay. It's visible only for me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that's okay. Uh, all right, uh, we will skip the demo with controls and go to the most interesting part uh, as for me, that's the timers. Timers are not documented anywhere anywhere at all. I am 99% sure that you could not find any articles in the web describing the timers in ALSA. Uh, so that's pretty exclusive information here. <laughs> the ALSA middle layer allows you to export the hardware timers so the other kernel models and the user space applications could bind their custom events to them. For instance, uh, the, ALS, the, the kernel module could bind to the timer, uh, set the desired amount of ticks, and after this, this amount of ticks, the, uh, the timer will fire and do some actions, and you will actually use the uh, timer of the sound card. Uh, let's take a look at how we can view uh, timers in your system. For this purpose, we can use the, our favorite Proca Sound, uh, Proca First Entry, which is really useful. You can take a look uh, at it in uh, more details because you, you will find a tremendous, uh, tremendously huge amount of uh, useful information there. Uh, and we can cut the timer entry. What, and we see a pretty interesting thing here. We can see that as a middle layer automatically allocates the timer for each substream registered in the system. That means that we actually, when we play some sound on them or when we capture some sound from them, every time they prepare a new chunk of data, the timer uh, related to this particular substream fires. So you can actually bind the events in kernel modules to the events of substreams to every time the substream processes, every time the hardware processes a new chunk of data for a substream, it fires your timer, which is amazing for, in my opinion. And uh, for instance, such uh, such driver as uh, software loopback, SND loop, uh, could bind to the 
drivers to, to the timers of our sound card and uh, keeps track of time using the uh, timer on other sound card, uh, which is pretty useful and funny as well. Uh, I wrote a demo kernel module, which uh, will help me demonstrate the timers in the LSS subsystem. Um, they are generally, oh, okay, I will show it about uh, after a little bit of explanation. Uh, to create, to ex export the uh, hardware timer, to make it visible, uh, we create the SND timer hardware structure, uh, which gets uh, some flags. Uh, the resolution, that means uh, the resolution in nanoseconds, uh, uh, it means uh, every, the, it means that your timer ticks with the, the interval of uh, some particular count of nanoseconds. For instance, if it's 100 nanoseconds, your timer will uh, trigger every 100 nanoseconds. After that, we could set the amount of ticks, uh, which could be uh, which could be set by the uh, kernel model or the application which would like to bind their event to this uh, timer. So, for instance, if the maximum amount of ticks is 100, that means that we can uh, schedule our event for uh, 100 ticks in advance. So it will tick every 100 ticks. Uh, we define a few callbacks, which actually are triggered when uh, the uh, user space application or the kernel model uh, wants to start the timer. Uh, the desired amount of ticks uh, is set in a ticks field of the uh, SNT timer structure, and uh, when and we can actually like tell our hardware timer that we would like to fire an interrupt after some amount of ticks. Uh, yeah, how we can bind to timer? To bind to timer, we can use uh, the structure which is called SNT timer instance. So we create the structure in our kernel module. We pass the desired uh, card uh, index, card ID, uh, the timer is based on. Uh, we pass the ID of the timer. And after that, we can uh, literally bind to this hardware timer, which is amazing. I will show it to you right now. Um, the, there is a module in the kernel, which is called HR timer. And what it does, uh, it actually creates the exports, uh, creates and exports the timer, which is virtual and based on the high, oh, high resolution timers, uh, which are not hardware dependent. So uh, that's the virtual time, virtual driver for the virtual driver. And uh, if I, uh, this model is load is loaded in my system by default. So when I cut the Proca sound timers entry. Uh, you can see it is available here. It is called G3 because it's a global timer. There are different kinds of timer timers in ALSA. I'm not sure about the difference between them, but you can specify the uh, interface your driver is related to. For instance, these uh, timers uh, are related to PCM devices. They start with the uh, PCM, uh, with the P char. Um, so the high resolution timer uh, is a virtual timer in the system we could bind to. It has the resolution of uh, one nanosecond and uh, we can schedule our callback for uh, any amount of ticks up to one billion. Um, so that's actually what my small kernel model does. Um, it creates the uh, SND timer instance structure. Uh, it sets uh, the parameters which are related to this global high resolution timer. Uh, they create the new instance of the timer with this name. Uh, they set some flex to it. And uh, it set the callbacks. The first callback is called callback. <laughs> and it fires every time the timer fires. And the second one 
a second callback is called C callback, and it fires every time the uh, event is happening with our timer. For instance, then the timer is started or stopped. After that, we open the timer with SND timer open. Um, we pass the uh, slave ID, uh, which basically identifies this particular timer instance. Uh, and uh, that's it. So that's basically what this demo uh, model does is creates the uh, demo uh, demo FS entry you, you can use to like schedule the timer for desired amount of ticks. I will show it to you right now. Um, so here we have my model. I will insert it. Uh, all right, here we go. And uh, we have the debug entry in the, the uh, in the bind timer uh, folder. We have the timer entry here, and we can set the desired amount of uh, ticks we would like to trigger our event with. For instance, one billion, which is a maximum value. Uh, okay, six, nine. And here, oh, oh, sorry, not cat, but a echo. Um, and every second it fires a timer and prints the amount of ticks we set for this timer, uh, which is pretty funny. Uh, I provided uh, the sources uh, for this model in one of the slides. Uh, you will find the link to it and you can play with it uh, in your free time. Uh, yeah, it will be a good exercise because, as I already said, it's not documented any, anywhere. Um, all right, uh, we finished with timers. Now let's talk a, a little bit. Oh, we are running out of time. Can we uh, make a few demos? Sure. Do we have time for it? A few more we demos. have about twenty minutes. Um... Um, All right, so, uh, yeah, you... let me make the small demo in the first five or 10 minutes and after that we will have a Q&A session. I don't think we will have a lot of questions here. Uh, can we do so? Go All ahead, right. yeah. Yeah, great. Um, how to debug sound related issues, how to debug X fronts. Uh, there are a couple of ways how you can debug the sound related issues. The first one is tracing. And the tracing is generally a good option for debugging any kinds of issues within the kernel. Uh, for such purpose, you can use ftrace if uh, you have an issue on the kernel side, uh, and or strace if you have an issue in the also user space library. Uh, if you want to track some code paths, uh, you can use strace. You can use this uh, also specific debugging uh, procfs entry, which is called xrun debug. I will show it to you. Or you can use the king function of all debugging methods is uh, print k because uh, well uh, you can use print k for everything. Uh, how to do tracing? Uh, well, uh, the process of doing tracing for sound subsystem is not different from any other subsystems. Uh, so you so you uh, for instance could use the function graph tracer for it, uh, which will show you the exact time of the function execution, uh, time of uh, function calls, and you can find a reason why you have delays. For instance, you, you can, using the tracing, I figured out that I, in one of my drivers, I had a delay in hardware pointer function. And uh, basically the tracing helped me to mitigate such issue. Um, all right. The another thing you can use to debug sound related issues is uh, xrun debug. To enable this feature, you need to enable three uh, kernel configuration options, PCM x1 debug, variables procfs, and debug options. Um, uh, and uh, let me show it to you. I will restart my uh, QMO right now. Um, to simulate the, uh, the overrun error, um, I will use my PCM test driver. Uh, because it has a feature of injecting the delays into the uh, playback and capturing processes. Um, how will we do so? Uh, uh, I will connect to my virtual machine, 
with SSH and I will uh, put some negative delay. So the my, my driver, my virtual driver will produce sound samples and send request. Uh, oh, sorry. To do so, I can uh, echo to the one of my kernel parameters, scene tests, parameters, inject, delay. And every time I will record some uh, data. Um, what's the format for record? One second. Um, so we specify the note file, the count, or the, the, the time, for instance, five seconds, and the count of channels. So yeah, here we go. We have overruns here. Um, because we are producing the data insanely fast and some part of the data gets overwritten. Um, let's try to enable this external debug options. To enable the external debug options, we should write the value, the desired value to external debug proc of entry. Uh, the value is the sum of uh, uh, the values which corresponds to different debugging features. For instance, we can enable some additional logging. Uh, we can enable the stack trace every time we have an overrun. So let's take a look at it. Uh, to do so, we put an we, we set an echo to the um, uh, proc of s entry proc sound to the desired card uh, number. It is the card zero. Oh no, this card one. Uh, card one. Uh, desired PCM device capture and uh, extra debug. Also, we need to increase uh, the log level to see the log logging messages. And now, if we record some sound, it will get us a stack trace for every every possible issues issue happening in the sound subsystem uh, during our capture process. We can stop it here and take a look at the log. You can actually. And here we see that we have an X run on this particular substream, uh, on this particular device on of this card, the card one, device zero, and the capture here. Uh, we have a stack a call trace here, so we can actually uh, send it into the decode stack trace script and get the line when where the issue happened. As we can see, it happened in the hardware pointer. So the ALS middle layer detect, detected the overrun there. Uh, that's really convenient. I wish I knew it before I started developing sound card drivers. So that's a really useful feature and it has a lot of options. Uh, you can play with them in your free time as well. Another additional options to debug your uh, sound card drivers is to use also self test. Uh, they have a self test which can which tests your sound driver using different frame rates, buffer period sizes, different hardware parameters. It can test mi mixer controls as well. So uh, it actually can be very useful for det detecting the timing issues in your driver. Or you can use the SNDL loop, uh, the virtual software loopback driver, to compare the output uh, which you get from your hardware device if your hardware device has some loopback features, for instance, the hardware loopback. Um, so you can use the SNDL loop driver as a template driver, which you know works correctly, which doesn't have any timing issues, which works fine, and you can compare your drivers with it. Also, we can use the SND print K in France. Uh, we can use them anywhere <laughs> and always, but uh, to use the PCM specific logging functions, we have to increase the logging level in the message like that and enable the config SND debug option. Let me say a few words about my virtual PCM driver and I will be finished for today. Uh, that's the driver I developed for testing the ALSA middle layer. Actually, it has a few features, for instance, generating the random or pattern-based capturing data so we can read them in the user space and compare with the desired, with the expected uh, pattern, the expected order of samples. So we can be sure that, that we don't lose any data in between the hardware 
and the software in the user space. Uh, also, it can check the playback uh, for containing the pattern. So we can check the another way of data. Um, it can introduce some, uh, in inject some error errors and delays into the uh, PCM callback uh, into PCM callbacks, so we can test how the ALSA user space applications behave uh, when they face different errors, different X runs. And uh, yeah, so take a look, please take a look at the sources. Uh, it could be used for writing another virtual drivers because uh, covering the ALSA subsystem uh, with uh, a test is always a good thing because when we have more tests, we have less bugs. Um, also, you can look at the documentation for it. And uh, here you can find the useful resources. Uh, I used to prepare this talk. And uh, also, you can find the sources for the, the timer driver shown uh, and uh, the record and playback scripts I had. Uh, so the QR code is here. The source, uh, the links are also here. And the best information source about the ALSA is the ALSA so sources, obviously, because uh, you don't have a lot of documentation written, uh, and you always have to read sources to check it yourself. Thank you for your attention. Do you have any questions? <laughs> oh, everybody see the question uh, uh, Q&A box in the chat as well. <laughs> All right, uh, any questions? Or was it so clear that, oh. Uh, uh, All right. Uh, uh, any questions? Uh, could you explain the clocking situation in ELSA? Mm. What do you mean by clocking situation? Usually we bind, uh, oh, are you interested in the mechanics, uh, how the hardware notifies the ALSA middle layer that uh, another period elapsed or what do you mean by the clocking situation? Can you write in the chat, please? Um... Sorry, I might not be aware about the clocking situation and else. I usually then uh, the another period uh, el elapses. Usually the hardware has have internal clocks and every time, uh, yeah, uh, what does the hardware driver define the clock source, or is it possible that the client middle layer or client application does define this? Um, uh, usually, uh, the drivers have to define the uh, they 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 don't define the clock sources themselves. Uh, usually, the hardware have internal clocks. And uh, every time, then the, uh, and it basically synchronize, uh, synchronizes the uh, periods, the new periods of data with these internal clocks every time. Uh, so they don't uh, like export these clock sources into the kernel space. So another applications and another drivers could not bind to them if it wasn't done explicitly. I mean, uh, if. Uh, uh, I, I I mean, if we didn't define the timer, as I shown, so the the timers are the only way to expose the hardware clocks into the kernel space and bind to them. So the system clock clock is the separate. Are you asking about the system clock yeah. um, separately? I guess um, so that that system clock drives all of the timing in general. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes, uh, on the ultimate layer side, on the uh, 
on the on the driver side uh, you usually bind to the hardware clocks on the sound card but we don't but you do not export it to to the mm -hmm. outer space except as using the timers but the timers are running only then the playback or capture process is happening with the hardware um for synchronization of the AC middle layer, we use system clocks. For synchronization of the driver, we use hardware clocks. So, yeah. But you cannot access the hardware clocks from uh, the AC middle layer if you didn't like uh, explicitly export the timer. Uh, anyway, you can reach out to me uh, after the webinar in one of the uh, social networks like LinkedIn, or you can uh, easily find me in, in in the mailing list of the uh, of the kernel because I'm only Ivan Olof there, and uh, I will, will would be happy to discuss any questions uh, with you after the presentation. Maybe we ca could look into these questions together and uh, figure it out from the sources. From the documentation. Mm. Yes, yes, that's the that's how it works. The hardware clock on the card fires an interrupt. The driver notifies the AC middle layer that another another period of data is prepared, uh, and uh, the AC middle layer. Uh, copies the data from, from, from the hardware to the software buffer at, at this point. So uh, you could you don't export uh, the you, the timer on the on the board to the user space somehow. The only well uh, they are exported by default as timers as I already shown. Uh, the timers are exported for every substream, but the problem is uh, these timers are not running then substream is not running and uh, well, it has the resolution of the period, so uh, you cannot set the, the this timer uh, to any amount of ticks more than one. So the timer will fire after every period elapses. So it's not really precise. Just like the the thing which allows you to bind to the events, then then our period elapses. Yes, 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 that's true. The, so yeah, uh, usually the sound card is a clock master here. So yeah, any other questions? Any other questions for Ivan this time? Cool. All information uh, was so clear <laughs> that we don't have any questions. <laughs> there were there were quite a few questions, I think, earlier, um, Ivan, and you were able to answer yeah. all of them. I, I, I so tried to answer great. them. Sorry if I'm uh, not aware of something. Oh, I think I think you're, um, you gave uh, enough breadcrumbs for people to go look at things and um, find the demos are uh, yeah. good demos and showing all the tools that they can use. Looks like there is one more yeah, we'll question. Have... As we yes, yes, yes. Uh, changes that guy from Mentor made uh, to SND loop was to make it possible to choose uh, the SND timers as a sync source. Yes, yes, exactly. So you can actually synchronize the SND loop only with the, the timers which were exported. You can synchronize it with the the uh, uh, the timers of the substreams, which I already mentioned, that uh, it will be synchronized with the timer which fires every time the new period of information is ready, is processed by a new period of samples is processed by the hardware. But uh, 
uh, that's the 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 best precision you can get. So uh, you can bind only to exported SNT timers, which is not really convenient because I also would like the uh, uh, the to have the way how we can bind to like different timers in your system, for instance, on, for instance, net network clocks and so on. But we don't have such opportunity, unfortunately. Maybe it would be a good thing to implement such thing. Sure. Thank you, Ivan. Oh, another question. Oh, okay. SD timer, then uh, yes, yes, only like that. Unfortunately, again, uh, it would be great to have some kind of uh, timers which you can export uh, to the whole kernel space and generic kind of timers. You can use it so you can use them everywhere. But as far as I know, we don't have the one. Sure. Do you aware of such kind of thing? So the timer um, timer subsystem, are you talking about set timer, get timer type of situation? Uh, no, I mean oh. that you can export the hardware timer on some oh. hardware, abstract hardware device on the sound card, for instance, to the uh, whole kernel space, and you can use it anywhere. <laughs> right. I I think they do. The only uh, thing I know about is the system class clock that is exported through oh. that. Uh, system we have system class that's a master clock that drives the system timing and mm -hmm. obviously the the reason you probably wouldn't want to do that is a random uh called uh driving timing um random sound card driving timing for the entire system so there are some uh, mm -hmm. issues with security issues that are yeah. timing off issues so you have to system clock is maintained um and then your uh, system clock can be set by uh, NT um, network timing. So it's all set up during uh, boot up of the mm -hmm. system. So I think that is the reason why you probably do, wouldn't want to have multiple uh, timers um, and clocks controlling timing mm -hmm. of the system. Mm -hmm. So um, mm -hmm. it's it's fun to do these, uh, fun to have uh, experiment like that with the system uh, sound clocks and getting uh, using hardware timer on a sound clock, but I think in general, uh, it might not be a uh, for security reasons and other integrity reasons. Probably, it's not mm -hmm. going to be useful. Mm -hmm. That's that would be a reason to not do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it would be a funny experiment. So, if mm -hmm. uh, anybody wants to try, you're welcome. <laughs> Please CC me when you will send the patch. I want to take a look at it. <laughs> Thank you very much, Candice. Thank, Thank you, you Yvonne and Shua for your time today. And thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, as a reminder, this recording will be on the Linux Foundation's YouTube page later today. And a copy of the presentation slides will be added to the Linux Foundation website. We hope you are able to join us for future mentorship sessions. Have a wonderful day.